<laughs> Welcome back, Cotter. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that TV show, but there used to be a TV show that was on uh, television that uh, used to sing this song like, Welcome back. Da -da 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 -da. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Anyways, it was just kind of a dumb show that, you know, I think John Travolta was on it, you know, in his early days and a bunch of other people, but we haven't been in Colossians for a while now. And Bittyville Church kind of took a vacation, so to speak, while I was on the Mississippi River. And uh, being that today we're back in Colossians, it felt like a good time to say, hey, welcome back. Now, if you've never been a part of Video Church, we don't take things so seriously and we're not so adamant about being formal as we are about letting go, slowing down, and allowing God to find us in step with Him. You see, the Bible, in many ways and many different times and places, reveals something interesting about God. He's not in a hurry. You are. Maybe. I am. Certainly there's a certain amount of truth to our nation of America being always rushed, that wants everything done in a hurry, that wants to go through a drive through and get our food, that wants to be in step with the sun and the moon and the stars, so we have to rush, rush, rush from sun up to sundown. But what if we didn't? What if we just slowed down? What if we lived in a desert country like where we're talking about all of these scriptures coming from? A land that had the beating sun shining bright, forcing us to slow down and to not get out rushing or running anywhere. I think we would live differently, and I think we would act differently and understand the scriptures better if we realize you really don't want to run when it's 120 degrees out. As a matter of fact, things like being under the shadow of his wings or being in the shade or those types of things that we disassociate ourselves from because we don't think of it as being that important. Yeah, who cares if it's a shadow? Who cares if you're in the shade? Well, if you're dying from the heat, you're looking for the shade. And so, sometimes we don't understand as much as we think we do living in the West as they do in the East. But in Colossians today, we're in chapter 3. We're looking at the scriptures, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, through, oh, I don't know, I guess we're going down to verse 7. So we're doing... 5, 6, and 7. Now, you can turn there, and you can look, and you can see the context and the continuity of what's being said by Paul writing to the church at Colossae that he is discussing things that we should be doing and could be doing if we want to apply the truths that Paul has learned and is inspired to write based upon his personal experience with these people. Verse 5 says, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things, for which things, for which things sake, the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked some time when you lived in them. We got a lot here. I mean, mortify means kill it. It means to put it to death. It means to start a process of death working in these things that are our members. Our members simply mean that, hey, your hands, your feet, your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth, and your, your imaginations. You know, touch not, you know, touch not, taste not, see not. I mean, Jesus said himself that the reality of our sinfulness isn't only in what we do, but it's what we think. It isn't only in what we say, but it's in what we see. So there's more to reality of what we ought to do and we must do to mortify ourselves because 
Paul is making a direct connection to what Jesus said when he said, deny yourself. Paul is saying, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Your members that are upon the earth are that which is dealing with the external physical realities of this dimension that we live in. He's writing to the people that are, you know, a little bit Greek. You know, they got some understanding. But they're, uh, he's also writing in a phraseology of the times. Your members, you know, the members of your body. You know, that was kind of like you would say parts of the body today. You would say that you are a member of the body of Christ. Well, your members aren't just membership, but it's a phrase that's used in order to identify certain things that you do that means it's you doing it. You know, you could say, well, you know, my lust didn't come from me. The devil made me do it. He put some naked lady right in front of me, you know, and I didn't mean to go on the Internet to see it. Yeah, right. You're guilty, period. So, when he says, mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, he's talking about your practical reality of day-to-day -day living. He's just simply saying, hey, you know, I get it. You live in a lustful society. You live in a self-gratifying nation. You live in a place and a time where people indulge themselves in everything and anything. And they figure they can just forgive themselves and get away with it. Some people don't even feel as though they need to be forgiven. I know that we have currently a president in the United States of America that just simply figures that if he lies enough, he'll believe his own lie, and then he just accepts his own lie as being true. And that's common with millionaires. They do it a lot. Disassociative realities are existential within the person that denies the truth and wants to create his own perception and then allow for his mind to conceive of that perception as being true, so he goes out and changes the facts to create an alternative reality that isn't true. It's a lie, but it's still true to them. They believe their own lies. And that's the sad part of where you and I can't be. We must do the opposite of what we see the President of the United States doing. That's why he's called the Anti-President, the rise of the Anti-President. We cannot allow ourselves to become like Trump, but we can mortify ourselves to be like Jesus. Deny yourself. We can mortify our flesh. We can mortify ourselves. We can do these things to put away from us, far away, what we should not be doing anyways. Fornication. You know, it's interesting that they start off with fornication, because that's really where we are today. Abortion people. Christians go out of their way to pick on, fight, and battle abortion. Because they don't want to save the person. They don't want to save the mother. They don't want to save other people. They want to save the baby. And no matter what it takes, they're willing to do it. Unfortunately, fornication is what caused the baby to be there in the first place. So we're not dealing with the reality of what the sin is. The sin is fornication. The consequence is abortion because the mother realizes it's a baby of guilt and she doesn't want to raise it or she can't or she feels like somehow that she's ashamed of having a baby. Some of that's from God, believe it or not, because your conscience is programmable and God gives you a conscience to make you realize, hey, do not fornicate. This is what the results are. Now, I'm not advocating anyone to go out and have an abortion. I'm just saying you need to deal with the root of the problem whenever you talk about abortion. And that is fornication. So mortify it. Stop abortion by stopping the fornication. Don't go after abortion as the problem. Go after the fornicator as the problem causing a situation and circumstance that should never be named among Christians to fight for or fight against. That's not the problem. The problem is fornication. So... Mortify means to already admit you fornicate. You see, it means to put to death, but he's already recognizing, and you should, you're a fornicator. I'm pretty confident of that if you're a man, because most men, really, their imagination can go wild at times. And that is fornication too. Whether you 
perform the act, think of the act, or do the act. Yeah, fornicator. Now, what that means is to slowly bring about a change in your perspective. If you have an issue with fornication, which all men do, then don't put yourself in the position of fornicating. Don't take your clothes off. You can't do something if you got your clothes on. That's kind of old style common sense chastity belt thinking, but if you don't go on the internet, you're not going to see porno. At least not really, unless you've got porno hidden all over your house. So, you can deal with it if you're willing to do it. And that's what mortify means. You have to take the steps, slow steps, whatever steps, but you need to kill it. Cancer can't be held at bay. Cancer is a mutation of the cells that causes a continual breakdown of the cellular structure so that eventually kills something that will that you need for life in your body. And likewise, fornication as a sin will do the same thing. You cannot tolerate sin in you. It will kill you. You have to kill it, stop it, quit it, and get rid of it. Mortify. I was mortified when I found out, oh my God, I'm a poor. But really, fornication, as he lists it here, is the big uncleanness. You know, you could figure out for yourself. I mean, I deal with people from all kinds of walks of life, you know. One man's perversion is another man's liberality, you know. And do I think that the pervert is any less a pervert because he says that it's okay for him? No, he's still a pervert. But that's uncleanness. In other words, you can tell me all day long that, you know, it's okay to have oral sex. And I can tell you straight up, that's uncleanness. You can tell me all day long that it's okay to um, have intercourse, you know, in rearward parts, which is called anal intercourse. And I can tell you that's anal, because guess what? That's sin. In other words, whatever is not natural is unclean. And God has already specified what cleanliness is. Now, Paul is unfortunately having to deal with people that are a culture that are Gentiles. And Gentiles didn't really see things the same way that Jews did. Gentiles saw, hey, if it's got a hole, use it. Or, hey, if it's, you know, food, eat it. They would just literally, just slovenly and disgustingly do things that were abhorrent to other civilizations. Roman Empire had unfortunately accumulated a variety of pagans and other cultures and adapted them to themselves where they had a certain standard supposedly of cleanliness but at the same time would just as easily be disgusting. Much of what goes on in the Vikings culture was gross, disgusting, and abhorrent to anyone that had any sense of cleanliness, you know, putting snot in drinks or doing all kinds of weird things. I can tell you this, that it's very easy to understand what uncleanliness is because you can simply go into someone's house and find lots of things that are unclean. Do you clean your bathroom? Is your toilet spotless? Do you, in reality, wash your hands every time you go to the bathroom? In other words, there's a lot of varieties of what uncleanness is. And cleanliness isn't next to godliness. But cleanliness is where we begin to take the time to think about what we're doing. We think about what we should be doing. If you thought about what your actions are, then you would identify for yourself what uncleanness is to you. Because it doesn't take me sitting here and running through kosher and kosher and all the other perspectives of moral decay and decrepancy that happens to a society when it no longer has God at its center. But you can pretty much identify for yourself what you know is unclean. When we read of inordinate affection, it doesn't necessarily mean only homosexual or heterosexual or bestiality or some other weird thing. Inordinate affection can be a mother and son. Inordinate affection can be you and your Harley. Inordinate affection can be you and your favorite football team. Inordinate affection can be you and the American flag. 
inordinate affection could be you and your president. In other words, it's called affection, but it means improper place when you use the word inordinate, meaning that you've got the wrong emotion towards this thing or object or person that you're making it into an idol. It hasn't become one yet because you're not worshiping it, but your affections are towards it. How much do you like your baseball team? Good news for you, 90% of America, or 90%, I won't say 90% because that's pretty exaggerated, I guess, but a greater majority past 50 are inordinately affectionate towards their sports teams. A greater majority of people are inordinately affectionate towards their theology, even, when they want to say that we have to salute the flag, or we have to worship the flag, or we have to pledge allegiance. That's inordinate. That's not ordinate. That's not what God said. God said, don't make any pledges. God said, don't swear. And yet we turn around and we swear allegiance. To what? A flag? That's inordinate affection. You see, it doesn't always mean what you think it does, because on the one hand, you've taken it for granted for years it's acceptable to salute the flag or, or to pledge to allegiance. But the pledge was only added after people were terrified that communists were alive and well and living in America. And they weren't. It was a fear tactic. So then, oh, well, if you pledge allegiance and you know, you're swearing and you'll get in trouble with your communist father at home. That's not how it works. God will be your father and he'll tell you, don't pledge allegiance to the flag. That's not about allegiance to patriotism or nationalism. It's inordinate affection. So you sit down and you think about things that don't make sense, and you'll figure out what does make sense. Because God will start you on a, a trail to mortify, and if you choose to do it, then God will abide with you in doing those things that will cause you to separate yourself from the world, which is what the whole point is, and its ways, and lead you to a way of thinking of those things above, where Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Evil concupiscence. I like that word. Really, <laughs> you know, I want to come up with my own definition of concupiscence, but off the top of my head, I think I better look up and say, well, what does the Bible say? Well, actually, not what the Bible says, but what do people say concupiscence is? Because it ought to be interesting. I always take the time, you know, to verify my sources. You know, and wonder, well, you know, I know what I would say it is, but what do they want to say that it is in Merriam-Webster Dictionary? You know, and according to, you know, the dictionary on the one hand says strong desire, sexual desire stuff, but, you know, kind of another one that's a little better is, is the desire, wow, There we go, okay. Concupiscence, I mean, this is a, it says in Catholic theology, but I realize that this, some of the Catholic theology takes it from Jewish theology, which is about being more towards the animistic as opposed to the supernal. I know you don't know what either one of those words mean, so we'll just go with this, and I'll read it to you. In Catholic theology, concupiscence is seen as a desire of the lower appetite, contrary to reason. For Christians, concupiscence is what they understand as the orientation, inclination, or innate tendency of human beings to long for fleshy appetites, often associated with a desire to do things which are proscribed. There are nine occurrences of concupiscence in Dewey Reims, three in the King James, and blah, 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 blah. In Judaism, there is the evil concept of the Yetzer Ha, the evil inclination. This concept is the inclination of humanity at creation to do evil and to violate the will of God. The Yetzer Hara is not the product of original sin, as in Christian theology, but the tendency of humanity to misuse the natural survival needs of the physical body. Therefore, the na natural need of the body for food becomes gluttony. The command to procreate becomes sexual sin. The demands of the body for rest become sloth, and so on. In other words, rather than say Yetzer Hara, or to get into you know Jewish roots, I'm a Jew, but concupiscence is really to... Concup, you know, I mean, I want to say that, because I understand it in my King James way of thinking, but I know I can't communicate that to you. It's like taking a little and then, or wanting a little and then taking a lot. 
Do you understand that? In other words, a little might be good. A lot is sin. So if you had a little bit of food, then taking a lot is gluttony. It would be going beyond the measures of the instinct of reality to say no, and you do it anyways. In other words, like your first thought, if you're Eve, is that, you know, half, you know, God has said we shouldn't do this, so she knows she shouldn't do it. And then Satan comes back to her and says, Hath God said? Well, immediately. Questioning. Because it wasn't a matter to be questioned, it was a matter to just repeat it again. Hath God said, Thou shalt not eat it, blah, blah, blah. Just say it back to him. God has said. Even though she had added the touch part, doesn't matter. The point of it is, is being concupiscence and using it here as far as, let's see, make sure that he said it that way. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. Evil concupiscence is the qualifier that makes it into the inclination to do wrong when you know you should do right. It's easy to step aside and walk away and say, hey, you know what, that's them, not me. That's evil. To allow things to exist in, that, in reality without taking a stand or a step to say what is right. You know, you can go to work, you know, today. Now, I can tell you straight up, it's going to happen, you know, today. You go to work today and you could see something, you know, that the boss is doing and you could say, eh, that's his sin, not mine. Maybe he plagiarized his taxes. Plagiarized. Maybe he lied on his taxes. Maybe he plagiarized from a book. Maybe he stole this here or stole that there. Any number of things can be concupiscence. But evil concupiscence is when it's used in a way to bring down anything that is good or in a way to destroy what God is doing in someone's life. I would say evil concupiscence would be the President of the United States building a wall around America. That's evil concupiscence, because on the one hand, he's trying to appeal to your sense of security. Oh, we need to protect you. But God is our protection, so he's replacing God with a wall. That's evil concupiscence. The gun industry typically is evil concupiscence in the way that they present their material to say, Oh, you know, you need guns. You need to learn to defend yourself. My learning to defend of myself is in how I apply the scripture that says God will be my defense. I don't need to learn to defend myself. I need to learn how to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. That's it. God saves me. I do not. So, concupiscence is kind of confusing. In a way, if you look it up, I think you'll understand it better on your own level and, and terms because... <laughs> When we get into yes or hara, I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, okay, I got it, okay, you know, we're all there and I'm all over it. But I don't want to be, because we're dealing in Colossians, I don't want to be talking to you about that because when you're using the evil concupiscence, yeah, Paul's referring to yes or hara. You know, I mean, it's kind of like the evil inclination. The tendency of man to do evil, to do wrong, to do and become that with his most pervert, pervert, perverse in us. We are... <laughs> in our natural state, easily, including babies, full of the capability of going to and performing evil. I know a lot of people are going to say, babies aren't. Yeah, they are. Babies don't go to heaven either. I'm sorry. They don't. You still have to deal with your evil inclination, your sins. You have to be forgiven by Jesus. So, with concupiscence, we also study on that with which is said of the Remember, this whole section is on from verse 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So we're constantly making this comparison between what you should mortify on your body and that which is connected to the world and the earth as opposed to what you should be doing and thinking of the things in heaven and preparing yourself to live in eternity in a spiritual form, not in a physical reality that this dimension is. So when we look at concupiscence, fornication, and uncleanness and inordinate affection, and then we add another one, which is really interesting, because it gets into a place where most people don't think of it as being wrong. Covetousness. People think that covet is to want what someone else has got. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, if there was such a thing as saying what is the most American characteristic and tendency that we have as a people, 
it would be covetousness. And I don't mean coveting my neighbor's goods and wanting that with which he's got. No, it means I want what I want for me. It means selfishness personified in dealing with and getting that which satisfies my selfishness. Behind covetousness is selfishness, and behind selfishness is pride, and behind pride is your ego. Crucifying and mortifying these things, covetousness is the action that is performed when the reality of the selfish desire is given into, and you go out and get something for yourself. It's like, I deserve a Pepsi, so you go out and buy one. That's a form of covetousness. So you say, oh, but it's not so bad. Well, because you are talking about why it's already sin and you're trying to excuse it. So covetousness, all of these things that are being said are spiritual. They are, in fact, inside, but they are performed on the outside by doing something with them. So they affect you in an area of your life that's going to lead you in a wrong, soulful, emotional base experience, and then cause you spiritually to be excusing yourself that will bring spiritual death by doing the action on the outside that causes you to be noticed as having and being covetous. Covetousness applies to all areas of coveting and covetousness. So I don't mention to you now the extreme because you know what coveting is. You could covet your neighbor's wife, covet your neighbor's goods, covet your neighbor's, you know, Whatever it may be, you know, ah, oh, I wish I had one of those. Or if we put it into brass tacks, like my wife says, my, I ask my wife, I ask my wife all kinds of innocent questions because I'm not a woman. So I always ask her these questions and, you know, she understands now that I'm not being weird or wacko. I'm just trying to understand the human soma, psyche, and condition. <clears throat> so I said to her that, well, I said, you know, when I look at a woman, I see her eyes. I see her soul. You know, I look her in the eye and I, I identify that and... <clears throat> If I am in some way attracted to my flesh, it's because of her, her soul, her emotions, her, her way of looking. There's something there, you know, that I, I'm connecting with. And I, so I said, but I've noticed you've said things and you do things. I said, and I asked her, I said, so you check out other women? She goes, oh, yeah. I said, so what do you look at? Well, we look at her butt, you know, look at her breasts, you know, look at her legs, you know, look at her clothes, look at her shoes, you know, look at her shoes, look at her shoes. Did I say shoes? Shoes. Look at her shoes. I mean, they look at her shoes. But really, that's covetousness. That's coveting because it's not wanting to be like the person, but it's measuring yourself or measuring them. That's coveting. And so I was fascinated personally about what women look at and what women do and how women think. I mean, I still think it's very interesting because in a lot of ways, my wife, with the way that she was raised and the way that she had um, gone through her life experiences, is more in touch with the manly side of life, and I'm more in touch with the womanly side in some ways. I don't mean about the looking at women, but I meant about being emotive, and she's more pragmatic, you know, and I can be practical when I decide to just put on practicality. I mean, I can put on all these different formats easily for myself, but what God wants us to do is to be aware that these things aren't going there. You can't take them with you. You can't take covetousness with you. You can't take inordinate affection. You can't take the standard you have of looking at other people and then applying it to that with which you're going to experience in heaven. You have to get rid of it now or you will be tempted by Satan soon when he sifts you like sand and will cause you to stand or to fall according to what you've allowed in your life. So, with covetousness, we finally get to the summation of what that is. And he says it, which is idolatry. And it really is. I mean, it's just putting another God in place. Whether it be inordinate affection, fornication, uncleanness, evil concupiscence, or covetousness, which is idolatry, it's all idolatry, baby, because when you finally get to the sum total of who's being put in charge, idol, you're idolizing yourself, you're idolizing you over he and not being more like him as opposed to who you think you are because you think you got it and you want to be the one. And that ain't happening. I'm sorry. The way God wants to view you is that he has adopted you to become more like him. And he's changing you from glory to glory into the image of his incorruptible son. 
So we get to the place where we finally say, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Yeah. You got it? The wrath coming upon the children of disobedience. If you really want to know what that means, it means you're going into great tribulation. I mean, that's when the wrath comes. The wrath of God comes upon the church that exists in the Great Tribulation. Those that don't go in the rapture will be in the Great Tribulation. No, the church of God doesn't disappear and wind up in heaven. I'm sorry, some people will leave behind this earth and go in the event that we call the Natsal, the rapture, and they will be brought to the marriage supper of the Lamb and treated as a chaste bride that has prepared themselves for the coming of their bridegroom himself and have looked for and want to be with him always. They want Jesus more than anything else, and they're willing to give up the world for it. Sadly, there'll still be a lot of churches, we're told basically six of them, that will probably go into, because Jesus said so, into great tribulation and still be believers, because they did not mortify their members, which are upon the earth, the fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, and idolatry that they have in their life. So guess what happens? In which you also sometime when you lived in them. In other words, in the which you also walk sometime when you lived in them, in verse 7, applies to for which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience because God said get rid of it. If you don't and you won't, the wrath comes. If you do and you will, then you are one of those who walked at one time in the same things, doing the same things, acting the same way, but you were trying not to. You are seeking better to not live in them, but to walk away from them. Because when Paul is saying you once lived in them, he's saying you loved it. You were like, yes, I am loving it. I am like inside this sexual molestation thing, you know, and I'm a predator, you know, kind of like Donald Trump bragging about what he could do to a woman on the bus. And he lived in it, and he does it, and he did it, and he admits it. That's living in it. That's owning it and being proud of it. And that's what Paul's saying. You were the same when you lived in it, but now you are not that way because you walked sometime at, in it, but guess what? You don't have to anymore. You better not anymore. Because that's where we're going to end this, is, you know, in verse 7, is we're just going to talk for a minute about what happens because you don't mortify yourself. If you are a Colossian, which we all are, we've all walked in this kind of, you know, perversions and abstractions and idolatries and fornications and, you know, inordinate affections, even, even no matter who you are. I don't care whether you're Billy Graham. I mean, you know, bluntly. I mean, now Chuck Smith, he did talk about raising in a really Puritan-like, you know, atmosphere where, you know, he thought that he was going to go to hell when he went to his first movie. That's pretty pure. <laughs> But at the same time, he had inordinate affections and things that were like, you know, obscure, that were wrong, but his idea about it, but still caused him to be just like the rest of us. When you lived in them, you were such as that. And if he stayed in them, then the wrath of God would have come upon him. And the wrath of God only comes upon the world in the great tribulation, when God pours out his wrath upon all flesh. People say, well, the church isn't appointed to wrath. And I'm saying, baloney. Six of them are. Hello? What did you read? Tell you what God is saying to you. So, what we need to understand is that we have a choice to make today. You can either continue on. In your whatever you're in, dare I say, sin, or you can mortify that with which you know you ought not to do. I have personal sins in my life. I have some that have been like strongholds in my life. You know, it's like, ah, we got to assault that, you know, and tear down some of the walls a little bit. You know, we got to get better at this, you know, Lord. Yeah, that sucks. But I know some things will not terminate until this flesh is terminated. I know that this corruption will not be incorrupt until. This corruption puts on incorruption. I know that in my flesh there dwelleth no good thing, and I need it to die more every day than what I've allowed it to live as I'm living in it. 
So you see how that works? It means you have to make the choice. I don't have to sit here and look at you and see what you, sin you did or have you confess it to me. You know, we're told if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which is true. But the confession is for you, not for me. I don't care which sin you're in. I already know if I want, I already know because I'm in that sin. But, you know, really, <laughs> hello. But I know as a sinner that I'm wrestling with my issues. Now, if I want you to help me and me to help you, then we would commune to each other, get to know each other, grow with each other, you know, and then have the trust that we could share it with each other, the truth. But the truth is, uh-uh, I ain't dealing with you, buddy. <laughs> You're on your own, man. You go talk to God about it. <laughs> I'm on a video, hey. I'm not. You're not in my home. <laughs> but that's where it is. In video church, we have to say and be realistic about the truth. You must get alone with God and ask him to help you to mortify your flesh, your concupiscence, your evil inclinations, your sins, so that you would begin to learn how to walk with him to talk with him and to find him more than willing to not just forgive you, but to abide with you daily in bringing you to a place that you're no longer going to be called, you know, a Gentile or a Jew or a female or a male, but you'll be called one of the children of the Most High God. And that's why we set our affections above and not on the things below, because our direction should be up, not looking around. If you're looking around, then you're going to be found in sin. But if you're looking up and you're watching for Jesus, he's probably going to take you with him when he comes again soon for his bride.